hopefully in a few minutes. You all don't need to see my beautiful face. I'm just here to introduce um, and get the morning kicked off. But good morning. Thanks, you all, for joining us on a yeah. Friday morning. So for him, that would be an easy climb. Oh, somebody's uh, somebody might need to unmute or mute themselves out. I can't see who that is. I'll let the um, hosts work on that. But everybody here, okay? Awesome. Yeah. Um, thanks, guys. Um, Okay, well, I'm Sasha Tripp. I'm the, the chair of the Professional Development Master Group, and I want to officially welcome you to the September Latte and Learn. And as you all know, this session is focused primarily on new construction home inspections, and our guest speaker today is Scooter Burgess, um, who started Burgess Inspections in 1993 as a single inspector home inspection company, and then he's grown the business to be one of the largest full service commercial and residential property inspections companies in Virginia. Um, his company's mission is to provide world-class customer service by being the most trusted property management, or excuse me, property inspection company in the industry. Um, he began his career as an electrician in 1975 and operated his own uh, electrical contracting company for eight years. And then he served in many leadership roles in the inspection industry. He's been an ASHI member since 1993, past presidents of the Virginia Association of Home Inspectors and president-elect of um, Central Virginia ASHI. So I will officially, Scooter, if you're ready, um, hand the session over to you. And we're excited to get started. And someone else may still need to mute out. So um if you're on your cell phone or if you're on your computer and you have any background noise, please do mute out and then we will turn it over to Scooter. But thank you so much for joining us. Thank you guys so much for having me. Uh, it sounds like I've done a whole lot done it, all that stuff. But anyway, it's been a journey of love. I've grown to enjoy the whole process of the inspection world. I mean, of the real estate world from the beginning to the end. So it's, it's been a journey. But anyway, like I said, today we're going to talk about uh, getting inspections on new construction. Uh, if anybody has any questions while we're going along, please feel free to raise your hand and just ask them. Uh, we'll monitor how long it takes or put it in the chat. We want to honor y'all's time. So, but if you want to put it in the chat, put it in there. Uh, we will. If something happens, we don't answer your question. I promise we will get back with you. Lunch. Make sure you put your name in there, in there. But I think that automatically goes. So we're going to go ahead and get started about new construction inspections. Uh, what we're going to uh, talk about today is the different phases of the inspection, uh, benefits to clients obtaining new construction inspections, important facts about new construction, and types of the defects we find at construction inspections. The types of defects we find, we're just given a small number of them. I mean, it's a at times an endless list that we get, but because of time, we just put a few of them in there. So these are not the only things that we find. And there are three levels of new construction inspections. Uh, the first one is the pre-drywall, which is sort of self-explanatory, I think, before the drywall and insulation goes up. The next is the pre-closing. Uh, which I guess is more of a traditional type inspections people have done on new construction in the past. And that's before the clients take possession of the home. And then the last one is the level month warranty, which is a very important inspection because that's usually the last time that the uh, buyer of the house has any real interaction with the builder or can ask them to fix things. Other than major structural warranties usually run out a little bit longer than a year. Uh, so the benefit to a client for getting a new construction inspection, even high quality builders can have oversights. And we when we go into an inspection, we don't go in there saying that real, I mean that builders will be trying to get over on somebody. We like to think everybody has good character. And so, but we're just going in there to help them find any oversights in there. Uh, issues found early can be resolved before the client moves in. Well, a lot of times, even though the builder does take care of most of these issues, uh, it's a huge inconvenience if something comes up after you've already moved in and you got water leaks or whatever. So it's just a 
big inconvenience. We don't, we can't find everything. It's impossible to find everything, but most of the time we're, we're pretty good at that. Uh, you, we can document issues that exist prior to moving in, just so you have a little. The client will have a little bit of information to give to the builder if push comes to shove. Uh, some issues that get covered up during construction can cause problems in the future. That's why the pre-drywall inspection is so important. Uh, buyers typically expect new homes to be perfect, but this is not the case. I mean, a home is a, really a living, breathe, not living, well, I guess it is living, breathing uh, system. And so it moves, it expands, it contracts, it's made of, most of them are made out of wood. So it, you cannot get a perfect home. And a fresh set of eyes can identify problems even the contractors can miss. And later on in the presentation, I got a slide that shows you, and everybody will go, how do you not see that? But sometimes you can't see the trees for the forest. And then important facts about new construction. And the timing uh, can be a little challenging sometimes. Uh, builders always, you know, they have, they have a, a schedule that they try to go by. So if you have a client that wants to schedule like a pre-drywall inspection, don't have them schedule it a month out because there's a very good chance you're going to have to ch I mean, uh, change that date because of weather, a lot of different factors. People, builders can't get in materials. So you want to wait you know, to maybe a week out or two weeks out before that any type of these inspections are scheduled. Uh, inspector qualification. Did, who knows that to inspect the new, well, let me back up. In the state of Virginia, you have to have a license to do a home inspection, correct? Who knows that to do a construction or a new home and a new home is defined as a home that's uh, been completed but has not been lived in for a year. Who knew that you had to have a separate licensing for that? Uh, it's called an NRS, a New Residential Structural License. And any of the inspectors that you have doing a new construction want to just make sure that they have that designation. And then a big one that we get, especially from realtors a whole lot and from clients, I guess, is when the county or the city inspector catch this. Now, I've sat in on a lot of talks with local jurisdiction inspectors. When they come out of a morning, most of the time they got a pile of tickets that they have to get them done that day. And so they're very limited as to how much time they can spend on the inspection. Also, I don't think anybody's ever seen a county or city inspector climbing up a ladder or having a ladder. They don't carry them on the jobs. Now, some of the outlined counties, they might do that, but I know here in Richmond and in Charlottesville and surrounding counties, you never see a city inspector or city or county inspector with a ladder. And 95% of them are not going to go into the crawl space. They might bend down to look at it. So they just can't catch everything. Now, the first section we're going to talk about is the pre drywall. And we pull up there. This is typically what we see. Uh, the one on the, uh, uh, frame, the frame on the left is most of the time they've got on the roof, they at least have the underlayment on the roof. There might not be the shingles on there. Sometimes they have the building wrap will be on there. Sometimes the siding will be complete, but that's just to have that in different stages, depending on the builder. And the picture to the right, the frame to the right is more representative of what we want to see on the inside of it. And that's, you know, we want to be able to see the house before the sheetrock goes up and also see it before the insulation gets in. Uh, and another thing, I think I, I asked y'all this before, if you have any questions, just let us know as we're going along. Oh, I'm sorry, I've been notified we have two questions. Let me see if I can do this in the chat. We have got four questions. 
Scooter, I can read them out to you if it would be helpful. Um, Janice was asking a little earlier, do you do these as an instruction? I may need her to clarify. Do you do these as an instruction package or does each inspection have to be purchased a la carte? Um, and Janice may chime in to add to that if you're not, if I, unless you know exactly what that means. I think I understand it. Uh, no, we do have packages that we do, you know, the, Buzzword is bundle. We do have a bundle for inspections. And the way we do ours, if a client does two or the three inspections, we give a 15% discount on the second inspection. If they get all three, we give a 25% discount on the last inspection. We don't discount them as we're going along because we've been burnt a, a few times on that client said yeah we'll get all three of them we want 25 percent discount and so we just do all the discounts at the end does that answer okay yeah. yeah i understand now what you were saying and oh yes janice says that answers her question so thank you for that and then okay. um another question where can you go to find out if the inspector has the certification so the new construction kind of additional level that you were discussing very familiar with that. You can go on uh, Google Depot and then Google home inspectors fall under lead, asbestos, and home inspections. That's where we find our uh, fall under. And then once you click on that, there's a, a list of everybody that's licensed in Virginia. It has the NRS license and also has the state license. Okay. Great, thank you. And uh, Paritha may have to ch chime in. Those are the only two questions that I could see. So I may have missed something. Okay. Extras. Otherwise, we'll turn it back to you. Okay, thank you, Madden. Madden, Madden is here and she's keeping me straight on this. Uh, so we, like I said, we're saying we'd like to see the house before the, uh, we obviously do a pre-drywall. You have to see it before the sheet rock up, is up. And we like to see it before the insulation is up. That doesn't always happen. We can still do it with the insulation, but it makes it a little bit, we do a little better job with the insulation not being present. Then I'm not moving. Y'all bear with me one second. <laughs> And Teresa has added the link over in the chat for any of the agents that want to go directly to that D4 site. So while Scooter is getting rolling, you guys all have that as a resource now. There you go. Okay, cool. Thank you. All right. The first part we're going to talk about is framing. And this is really the only chance an inspector or client will have to look at the framing. Of course, we're looking around large openings. Are they framed correctly or uh, over top of them? That's where uh, more of the load bearing goes. So we're looking at that. But we're also looking at like this uh, frame over to the left, loose wall sheet. That uh, OSB board that should be nailed or screwed to the studs. And if you look close on this one, which you really can't see with this, and these are all real pictures that came from our inspections. Uh, they, they nailed it, but they missed the studs. And what that can do, once they put the siding on, if this is on the back of a house, for instance, a lot of other things can happen with it, but and you get a bad wind, which y'all have a lot of wind up in that neck of the woods. It blows on the front of the house, on the top of the house, and then it creates suction on the back of the house. So it, it's trying to pull the uh, siding some, and then with this siding, uh, some, uh, the sheathing loose, it will loosen, can loosen and damage the siding on it. The next thing here is this, I believe what this was, I can't remember was a top or a shower or a tub, but obviously they put the drain in there after it was framed, which is always the case. Now, when you move, when you put a tub or a shower in, they don't have much room that they can maneuver around. Like if it's going to hit a, a floor joist like this, they can't really move the tub to miss it. 
So they have to cut the I mean the floor joists. And with floor joists, you can cut them, but the only place you can cut out is the center. And you can't cut out more than a third of the center of it. You cannot cut the top or the bottom joists out. So if you ever own a house and you see where the top of the uh, joist has been notched, that's a no-no. It completely compromises the joists on that. But it's a very simple fix, and this is a very common problem, but they just have to put another four joists in parallel to the existing one as close as they can get to it. Uh, another thing that we see quite often, this is a truss system. I mean, everybody's heard about trusses or stick built. With trusses, they're a little bit different animal than a stick built. A stick built, a rafter can get broken and it doesn't compromise the whole roof. But with trusses, they all work in unison together. So if one is compromised, it can compromise you know, the next one down from it or the next one down from it. Like you guys get a little bit more snow than we do. You get, and the houses today are built so tight, you know, concentrating on energy efficiency. The old older houses, the snow would just melt off the top of them because all the heat that you pay for will rise up and melt the snow. But on newer houses, snow tends to stay on a lot more. So this is a, a floor joist that's been compromised right here. The only problem, I'm mean not floor joist, I'm sorry, truss has been compromised, is that legally the only way you can repair a truss is you have to have an engineer design it. You're not supposed to just get, you know, Johnny come lately to come in and fix the truss. It's supposed to be designed. Uh, Another one that we see quite often is a bowed stud. Now, if you ever go to Lowe's or Home Depot picking out wood for a project or something and getting two by fours and look down them, there's not a whole lot of straight wood around anymore. But they do have tolerances. And I left my tolerances, I apologize, but you can't, the stud can't bow out more than a half an inch in an eight foot vertical run. Or it can't bow, or floor plate, like right here, can't bow out more than three eighths of an inch in a 32 inch span. And what that does, if you got bowed studs, you know, your sheetrock gets bowed, there's it's more of a chance that the seam is gonna come loose in the sheetrock. Uh, we'll touch on plumbing briefly. With plumbing, of course, when they run the uh, plumbing li lines, they run them through the studs. They they try to keep them to the center of this, much to the center of the studs as they can be. It's not if it's less than an inch and a quarter from the face of that stud, they're supposed to put a nail plate right here. Because the reason for that is when they put the sheetrock on. And they screw the sheetrock, which most of it is screwed today. A lot of it's still nailed. But if if it's up too close to the front of it and the tip of that sheetrock screw or nail just got into the pipe a little bit, it might create not create a leak right then. But as time goes on, when water runs through that pipe, even though you strap them, they do get a little bit of motion to them and you can create a leak. And I'll show you what those nail plates look like in, in just a, a minute. And then also, you want the outside plumbing pipes, the supplies anyway, need to be insulated. You can see where this has been insulated, but I don't know whether they hadn't finished or whatever, but this part of it has not been insulated. Now, I was telling y'all one time you can't see the forest for the trees, or sometimes builders are something to be on the be done. They know it's got to be fixed, or they may not, and they just they're on the site every day and they don't see the tree because of the forest. And this is an example of one we had right here. This is a plumbing vent stack that goes through the roof. You've all seen them on houses. 
And that's just a straight open pipe. There's no cap on the top of it at all. And so if the sheetrock gets put up nine times out of 10, this is not gonna be corrected because nobody's gonna see it. And also right here, you're dumping sewer gas into the attic, which is, is not very good at all. And when it rains, like I say, this pipe is completely open, just a straight shot up through the roof. So eventually you're gonna see a water stain on the sheet rock below it. But this is a pretty interesting picture, I think. It, it looks worse than it is. You see where that pipe is frozen? But what they did this, I think we just took this shot just, well, there was a purpose for it. Once they finished the plumbing on the draining, they filled the plumbing lines up to make sure there are no leaks. And so they just took and put on this pipe right here up above the plumbing. It's got to be up higher than the plumbing where they put the water in. If not, it'll run back at this fill pipe right here. I keep pointing. I know y'all can't see me pointing, but I forget the, the electronic pointer. And something probably got stopped up down here. And so water was left in the, well, they leave the water in the pipe for a period of time anyway, just to make sure a leak doesn't happen. And, and the pipe froze. And the way my inspector wrote it up, he, he wrote it up as such. He said, also, he could not determine if the pipes downstream like these had been damaged due to the, due to the freezing of it. On the electrical, uh, whenever electrical wire passes from the, first floor, from the crawl space or basement to the first floor or from the first floor to the second floor, in the wall is supposed to have fire stop in there. And that term's a little misleading because once the fire gets going, it's really hard to stop it. What this does right here, it slows the fire down because once it gets into a wall cavity, then it just shoots right straight up that wall to the next level. And we've got one of our inspectors here in Richmond that's a fireman, and he can tell some pretty interesting stories about stuff like that happen. So it's a very simple thing. There's different ways you can do it. I think most builders now just use these foam, these foam spray cans. It's easy and quick. Good. They do they do have some approved uh, uh, materials where you can stuff down in there. And this is the uh, same thing with the plumbing pipe right here. You don't, this look, This is in pretty good shape. This does not need a nail plate on it. I'll show you the nail plate in just a minute. But if it's close to the inch and a quarter to the front of that stud, it does need to have the same type of nail plate. Now these are the nail plates I've been talking about. These gray items right here. Uh, they come with little tips on the back side of so the builder does not have to use nails, just puts it up and takes the hammer and hit it at the top and the bottom and it's good to go. But they're very important. They can save a, a, a buyer a lot of headaches down the road because same thing can happen with electrical items, can happen with plumbing. That sheetrock screw can just tip into it might not cause any problems right now, but as that house expands and contracts, it can call, cause a short circuit in your wall. The other one is, is mold. It's impossible to get rid of all the mold in a brand new house because y'all have all seen construction sites. Some builders are better than others at covering the materials up when it gets on site. Uh, but a lot of times, unless the builder is very lucky and he builds his house and frames it up in the dry season, it's going to be some wet wood put in the house. And of course, with wet wood comes our favorite word, mold. Uh, it's very easy to take care of this. Uh, it, mold's got to have a food source. It's got to have water and oxygen. And obviously, the food sources on this is a food source for mold is any type of organic material, which is uh, wood here. Now, if, if I'm a client and I see, a, of course, di different clients react differently to the M word. If I see a little bit of mold, I'm not worried about it. 
if I can go in there and I see like mold is covering all the studs and joists and stuff, I'm gonna bring that up as a concern. All right. Thank you. Uh, the next one we're gonna touch on is HVAC. Uh, this is when people, when builders build a house, most of the time when they put the uh, HVAC heating, venting, and air conditioning ducts in, the, most of the time on, on the first floor, they go in the floor. And the biggest energy loss on a home is around windows. So typically most of the vents are underneath a window. And this particular one right here, not as much and properly installed, but a lot of times the windows don't get installed for a period of time. And so when it rains and the rain comes through that window, I'm sitting here gesturing and stuff, nobody can see me. <laughs> but when the when rain goes through the wind through that window and to that duct, it sags the duct down and the duct is filled up with water. And we find we found this on houses seven and eight years old where it was never determined. I mean, that was never found during the construction phase of it. So we, we don't see this all the time, but pretty common. Uh, the next one is, this is a little bit more of a pinched duct. It doesn't look that bad, but it does restrict some of the airflow through it. I mean, this restricts all the airflow when it gets filled up with water. But this just restricts some of the airflow on it. Uh, the next one, this was quite interesting. This is a return duct. This is a, a supply duct where air comes out, you know, uh, it's either heated or cool comes out here. So what happens, and they got it covered up. Most of it's a really good idea to ask the builder, do they cover the ducts during construction? Because if not, I mean, they can get filthy with sawdust and everything in the, in the world in them. So they got this covered for all this. But with this, as your heating and air condition is, is running, it's coming out this duct. This being a return duct is just being sucked right straight back. It's not even being in you. I mean, you, you're paying to have your stuff heat and cooled and you're not getting use out of it. Any, do we have any questions on? Okay. Uh, the next one we're going to talk about is the pre-closing inspection. And you can tell us pre-closing because we have construction workers camped right here on the front porch. Uh, usually we will always have workers at a pre-closing because inadvertently not a lot of builders due to scheduling whether you be able to get materials it, it always working right up to closing hour on it and about. But one of the big items that's so important on a pre-closing inspection is called fragile items. Obviously, over here to the left, that's a window that's fragile. Over here to the right is some, some excuse me, some fake tiles, a laminate tile, and you can see where the outer edges come off of it been knocked off of it. Same thing holds true for fiberglass tubs or showers. What I'm getting at is that these are not caught before closing and the client calls the builder up a month later and say, hey, I've got a broken window or I've got a tile that's cracked or my tub, fiberglass tub is cracked. How does the builder know that you know, the client didn't have one of those great big Costco shampoo bottles setting up on the side and knocked off and you know broke the crack the floor or the or the tub or the shower? Or how do they know that this didn't get done doing move in or this window wasn't broken? So typically this is the last chance that you've got to have the builder come in and fix these fragile items. And you will definitely, with your laminate countertops, you still see some laminate countertops. If they're chipped or, or anything chipped or broken, 
that this is the time you want to have it documented. Uh, this right here is uh, shingles. Uh, these people really moved in. They already got the grill in. But the problem with these shingles here is they're hanging over too far. And shingles are really not meant to be bent. They're meant to be flat. Although at the top of the shingle, at the peak of the roof, they usually bent over top to make the ridge, but they shouldn't bend. And after this is not going to cause a problem for a while, but after a while, these shingles will continue to bend until you get a crack right along here. They're just supposed to hang over, I think it's like an inch and a half. And that goes for the side of the roof as well as the front and the back of the roof. Uh, this is something that, in all honesty, is very hard for us to catch at this stage because you really don't want to be lifting up shingles a whole lot because they're sealed down and you can break that bond. It's easy to do it on a warmer day because it was sealed back, but on a real cold day when everything gets frozen, you really shouldn't lift shingles like this. But this is just an example of a... a a nail that's been overdriven. What happens to that, I can speak personally to that. A little embarrassed, my wife and I built the house 17 years ago. And they, because they put roofs on so fast, I'm, I'm not there overseeing it the whole time. They put staples in the roof. I say they fasten it down. They just go along, bam, 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 put no staples in. So we noticed, I guess, a year or maybe two years, we'd come home and look, because we got a big, tall roof, a steep roof, and see it very easily. we see a shingle slid out a little bit. Well, what in the world is that? And then we started seeing more and more. So we had it patched a couple of times. And then I think after like 10 years, we just, which is way too early, we replaced the whole roof. So. This is, is not a good thing. Uh, another thing we see on roofs is if you look at a shingle by itself, you will see a lot of markings on it, nail lines, exposure lines. And this right here, <clears throat> you're probably not going to see it from the ground. See that little white area right there? That is not supposed to be exposed. There's a little bit more of it up here. This is uh, over here is a little bump out and it's got a short metal roof on it. Now this really is not going to cause problems per se, but it's not supposed to be like this on this metal roof. What this, these are, these are little binders. Wherever those uh, metal seams come together, these, this is one of the methods they can put this on there and clamp it down to seal the roof. So these just should have been cut off. Uh, one of my favorite topics is synthetic stucco. Uh, we got a really good presentation we can do on synthetic stucco or EFs, or uh, exterior insulation finishing systems. Uh, some people call it drive it, but, and I know you've all seen it, it's usually you find it on upper end homes. Uh, that, this is not to be confused with real stucco that you see that was built in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. That's a, a different animal than this. But the same rules apply. With synthetic stucco, it's very important that you don't get water behind it. The newer systems have drainable systems, which help a lot, but I've seen them installed upside down and everything, but you do not ever want to re rely on a drainable system to make sure it's done, but any cracks need to be sealed to <laughs> keep water out. This next is one of the biggest, I guess everybody has heard about it, I guess in the 80s and 90s, they had all these class action suits, actually into the 2000s against some East manufacturing companies. And we were very involved in the testing on this because they had on these suits, they had to have all these houses probed for moisture. And the number one culprit we found was seeing it uh, 
install like this as opposed to this. No siding is supposed to run all the way down and touch the roof. I don't care whether it's hardy plank, vinyl, or whatever, it should not touch the roof. It's supposed to have at least a two inch gap underneath there. And then with this, what happens, it, it run, water runs down, it hits right here at the end of the gutter in the sheathing. This uh, covering right here is a very good, some, a lot of times we find the gutters go up before they finish this off, the final coat, coat on there. So water typically runs right behind here. And if you got a one-story house, if it's been there for a few years, you go in the crawl space, look underneath there, you're going to see rot there. If this is a second story house, it can rot all the way from the second story all the way down to the crawl space or basement. If this is the proper way for it to be, this is called a kickout flash. It's just a, a, a manufactured piece of plastic. And the way it is like this, when the water runs down here, it hits in this little trough and dumps into the gutter. Hence the name kickout flash. So if you uh if you ever looking to buy a house, I mean clients want to buy a house, just when as a new house, just make sure this is installed. All right, I've been informed we've got a question. Jamie Waller asks, what year would be considered newer eats? 2022. <laughs> no, uh, the drainable systems were first came about in the I mean in the early 2000s, and they got different variations of these <clears throat> drainable systems, and so that's when they started having that. Like, if, if that's the answer to your question, I, I don't know the exact date, but if you want to look smart sometimes and you're showing a house you got synthetic stucco at the very bottom of it, don't just go there and run your hand along the bottom because it's supposed to be cut up from the ground about you know, at least 10 inches or so. You should fill a piece of plastic underneath that with little holes in it. But always get down and look first because spiders and bugs like to hang out around that. So you don't want to run your hand across the black wood of does that help your question, any? Okay. Good question. It does. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. Like I said, we've got, I'm not trying to promote this, but I think it's a very important thing. We've got a, a lot of agents were not around when this class action suit came out against driving. So they weren't around when all that stuff was going on and they're not aware of, of all the problems they could have. And so we'd really, we love to come do in any type of presentations for you guys. We can do it anywhere from usually a half hour to uh, to an hour, depending on what you would like. Uh, the next one is stone veneer. I'm gonna speed it up a little bit. I think I got 15 minutes. Uh, stone veneer, I'm just gonna stick to this slide right here. Biggest thing you need to know, this is improper. It's not supposed to run down to the surface. I think this is a sidewalk right here. It's supposed to be held up two inches from any hardscape. If it's ground or dirt, it's supposed to be up four inches. And that's so water won't wick up in it. A lot of people are saying, in fact, I'm getting ready to go to a seminar not too long from now, that synthetic stucco or the stone veneer is going to be the next driving situation because it's not put on, a lot of times it's not put on correctly. And this is the reason why this is supposed to be a sealant right here, a specialized sealant that goes in there because this piece of material right here, part of, probably a hardy plank type thing, a cemented side, side uh, siding trim, and this stone right here, they're going to move things like say the house expands and contracts. This moves at a different rate than this. I mean, you can't, obviously, you can't, at least I hope you can't see it moving. So it's supposed to be a, a expandable and contractible sealant right in here with any dissimilar materials meet. And that keeps it from happening because what happens with this, this is mortar stuck in here. 
it's going to dry up, crack, water getting in, sometimes the water even moves from it. So uh, on these, if you see this is a no-no, if you see this is a no-no also. Uh, obviously, gaps, water gets in. You're not supposed to have, have gaps in it, and you're right the sealant. The builder is required to caulk a house in required areas one time. If it, if the caulking falls out or cracks, you know, six months into it, the builder did not sign on to maintain the house, and that's all uh, falls under home maintenance. Uh, I don't know how this got missed, but it's uh, missing flashing at the deck. And I think we all know the importance of flashing. When water comes down, it keeps from dumping back into the house and it kicks out. Uh, HVAC, once again, small crawl space. This wasn't present. They didn't have this present during the pre-drywall. And so... Uh, when they ran the ducks in there, they crossed, obviously, you can see it, not hardly any air goes through this one. Now, one of my favorite questions, how many sides of a door needs to be painted? Anybody got an answer? Just yell it out. <laughs> All right. Is it six? Yeah, correct. Six surfaces need to be painted. If they're not painted, they can absorb moisture. Mostly we're talking about hollow core doors here. They can absorb moisture and delaminate and come apart, especially in like a bathroom or high moisture area or laundry room. And you see they've got it right here, warranty voided, if not sealed on six sides. So it seems like a trivial thing, but it's, it's supposed to be like that. Our uh, kitchen, only thing I'm touching on on the kitchen is this is probably the only chance the clients are going to have when the pre closing, the clients are going to have to run appliances through. Once again, is the builder going to fix it if they move in and find out it's a problem? Yes, they should, but <clears throat> what kind of convenience is that going to be? This is obviously, the, this is not the, sit, the line coming in, this is the defective range. The uh, burners are bad on this. Uh, sometimes you're supposed to have a grass rail when you go up. Most people's hand won't fit on this as part of the framing. So to make them put an inch and a half rail up here where you can grasp it and it stands off from this rail. We have this one. Forest for the trees, how did this get missed? Because this one already had the CO on it. And you can imagine you got some kids, heaven forbid, you move to a new house. They run, look here, mom, we're going outside and open this door and, and run out and go off the rail. Then the last thing I'm going to talk about is the uh, 11 month warranty. We're going to time with five minutes. Okay. Uh, nail pops. Nail pops are, are created when the uh, sheetrock people secure the sheetrock to the studs. It's either nailed or screwed. Once it's nailed like this, they have, they have to come back and put sheetrock mud over top of it to hide that. They do it a couple times to sand it and blend it in. The sheetrock people, are, good sheetrock people are magicians in my estimation. But uh, the house is going to move, like I said, several times. And when it moves, a lot of times you will back those nails or those screws out and you see a little bumps in there. The warranty says that the builder is required to fix it if it breaks the skim of that sheetrock mud right here. <coughs> if it jumps, bumps out, they're not required to fix it. But it's a very good idea for your client to talk to your builder and find out what they're, how they handle these. The warranty says they're supposed to fix it if it cracks it, but, but some of them will fix it if it's just a bump on it, bump out. Oh, uh, and you want to ask them, do they paint it? Some builders paint, some people, builders don't. Oh, uh, this crack right here, is this structural or normal? It's probably just a normal crack, settlement crack. Uh, 
The warranty says you do the builder's not responsible for fixing every crack. And it's got to be over a sixteenth of an inch and not structurally related before they'll fix it. And this is I tell always tell clients when they move into the house and they see a crack develop, which it will develop, that are uh, not to call the builder right then to have them come fix it. Wait until that ten months or eleven months. Let the house go through uh, a couple of seasons so you can get all this moving and. Or uh, spanning contraction over with same thing with nail pops. Most builders will come out one time to do this. A lot of builders, if you look in there, they'll patch this, but they won't paint it. Reason for that, they're not being chintzy, but once you patch it and then you paint it, then they end up the homeowner says, But I, I can still see it. I don't want to be able to see it. And it's just like impossible to make it so you can't see it. Oh, HVAC, sometimes you can have a leak. This is an air handling unit. Sometimes you can have a leak, or it might be in the summertime when we look at the pre-closing. It might be some sweating going in there, so, so we assume it's sweating and not leaking. But then if out the period of time, it should not develop that much rust, rust in it. <laughs> These little condensate drain pumps that pump out the AC, the, the condensation from the AC, or uh, if you do it in the wintertime, we're not going to know whether this pump works or not. Uh, floors, squeaking floors, are builders required to fix squeaking floors? No. Well, only if there's an underlying structural issue to it. Uh, in other words, if they put the subfloor down and they don't fasten it to the uh, floor joists, yeah, they'll, they should fix that. That's going to squeak. But if the floor just squeaks, they're not, per the warranty, they're not required to do it. Split floors. Do they have to fix a split wooden floor? Only if it exceeds an eighth of an inch. And then the builder has the option. He can either fill it with a wood filler or he can replace the board. So you can imagine which option most builders would take. They would take, you know, filling it. Uh, uneven floors, if floors is uh, uneven out of a uh, 16th of an inch, an eighth of an inch in a, in a foot, that's considered unlevel. Crawl spaces, sometimes when we inspect the crawl spaces may be very dry in the summer or whatever, or leak up there. We're talking about that sheetrock nail going through the pipe might not have gotten all the way through. So it's good to come back and crawl in the crawl space again with the 11 month warranty. Like I said, maybe built during a dry season, have a lot of heavy rain, you come back in the crawl space filled with water. You should never ever have water in a crawl space. Uh, I talked about this before. And now, are there any questions? I feel like, I'm sorry, I feel like I sort of rushed at the very end to, Make the time frame. No questions. That means I, I did a good job, correct? You did a great job, Scooter. I <laughs> have a little question. Um, like it for this is just more generic. If you're a brand new agent and you know, lots there's so much in houses, there's just so many systems, things to learn. If you're a brand new agent, what are one or two of the things of all the stuff you talked about? Um, what do you think you see the most often in house in the new construction inspections you're going through right now that should be noticed or taken note of? We see water in a crawl space a fair amount. And the answer to that question from the builders sometimes, most builders are very good. They want to give you a good product because they're just like you and myself. We work off referrals. And they work off referrals. So they want to give you a good product. They don't want to have somebody bad mouthing. But anytime a builder says, well, yeah, it's water in the crawl space, that's okay because we've had a lot of rain. To me, that is an incorrect answer. So water in the crawl space. Uh, we see uh, up in the attic a lot of times, we see they forget to put the, uh, the collars around the vent stacks to go out. And you end up with leaks there. Of course, we see an awful lot of bowed studs. I, I talked about 
beforehand, if you go to Lowe's or Home Depot, trying to pick out a straight two by four, you're not going to do it. And that seems minor, but it's, it can cause problems down the road. Uh, right off the bat, stuff like insulation, that's getting taken care of because the building inspector, he can see that. There's a lot of stuff that the building inspector can see. Right. Yeah, that totally makes sense. And I feel like, you, yeah, there, there are just so many things, but those are some of the ones that, you know, even from the standard eye of just even an agent, sometimes you can catch that stuff so that you know about it in advance. And then the home inspector is sort of focusing in on some of the deeper issues. But um, we had another question from Sasso. Is the one-year builder warranty, This I'm not sure if this is something that you can answer or if you can speak to it across the board, is the one-year builder warranty something that all builders offer on a personal basis or is it required? And then the second question is if it's required, where can you find what is required for all new construction builders? I'm not sure if that's um, totally up your alley, but you can certainly speak. Most builders have a warranty that they give. Some of them can self-warranty the builder. Most, most of them don't do that. Right. Or uh, as far as where can you go to to get a list of things that's on that warranty? Or uh, I don't know anywhere publicly you can go, but if you have a relationship with a builder, they normally in their packet they give a copy of the warranty to the client. Right. In, in the packet, and maybe just go to a builder and ask them if they've got a copy of it. Yeah, and I'll agree with that. I have not ever seen it like publicly posted, certainly not across the board. Some builders, I have seen it on their like websites right. or their back-end files. But um, we, Sasso, this is a separate topic. We're going to have a new construction builder panel where the builders are sort of speaking to common obstacles and objections and things they're hitting. And that is in November, um, I want to say. And I know that I will be corrected if I am wrong, but um, that would probably be a good question because we'll have the builders front and center where they can kind of lead us more to um, more centralized resources. But um, I totally agree on that point that I've- Yeah, not... they get se several different you know, companies that issue these warranties. Right. And we like we've got a book that we have that's got you know, what's in there, but just by all of the warranties, all the tolerances and stuff is the same. You're like the sheet sure. rock. A uh, Richmond, Virginia new homes link to what um, it, what is mandatory versus elective. Um, so that is off in the side link. Thank you, Lori, for sharing that. We'll have to do a little bit more research on that prior to our actual builder panel as well. And that'll be a good question. We have access to that. Conversation oh, I'd like, I'd like to take a look at that. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. I've never seen, seen that. All in one place before either. Um, any other questions? We have a couple more minutes. If anybody else has questions that they would like to ask. Um, oh, Deborah Rudder is pointing. Oh, that this is very helpful. I've never seen this link, which is, unfortunate that I have missed it all these years. Um, Deborah just shared there is some Virginia code about specifically about warranties for new construction. So there's all sorts of links being shared in the side panel. So we'll all have to go read about them and catch up to speed. But thank you for sharing. And, and one thing you said, the code word, unfortunately, we even on brand new houses, we can't cite code. Right. That's right. That's the spectrum. Right. Which doesn't make sense to me because we cite it every day. We just had to we can't say the word code. We have the industry right. standard or whatever. Right. Well, very um, helpful, everybody. Does anybody else have any other questions for Scooter? I will say if anybody has any questions, feel free to call my office. Well, that's awesome. That's an awesome um, offer as well. And we're just super thankful for all your time and information this morning. I know that new construction, it's just a hot commodity and we are, we're going to be relying on it more and more in the coming years as inventory is so tight. So anything relevant, it's just super helpful for us to sort of all be on the same page. The more information we can get, the better. So I'm super grateful for your time. Um, if there are no other questions, I'm sort of scrolling through. If there are no other 
questions, um, we will post a couple of other upcoming classes and events off in the chat bar. And you see, this was the one I was referencing, November 2nd. Um, why you, oh, no, that's actually not the one I was referencing. November 2nd, this is this, the next latte and we'll learn why you need a structural engineer. So some sort of relevant um, information similar to what we were talking about today. And then um, I do believe it's the November GMM. And again, sometimes, you know, my brain houses information that's totally incorrect, but I'm thinking it's the November GMM where we have the new construction builder panel where we have a couple of builders coming to answer specifically, you know, how to get up and running in the process, but also like start to finish what they offer. And um, they would definitely lead more into warranties and inspections and things of that sort as well. So um, I hope you'll join us for our upcoming fun car classes. And thank you so much, Scooter. We appreciate your time. And I hope you get lots of phone calls from this. And I know we're all at least well, um, appreciate it than we were when we started this morning. So thank you so much. Thank okay, you all for I'm having adding, us. I'm adding in the link for the GMM. Oh, thank you. Was I right about that, Teresa? Was it November? Or was I just yes. Making... Yes. So it's roadmap to custom home. Builders. Okay. Right. Custom home. And I'm just putting in that link now. Awesome. Thank you. Oh, and let's check our CD classes coming up on October 2nd. So please join us and Donna and Michael Guthrie teaching through some of those. And that may, oh, look, there's more. I know. I'm so sorry. We do have a little slideshow. Um, I, was, I, I was thinking they were all going to be posted over in the chat. And then I was like, I think I'm one step behind. Okay, well, share us the slides. We would love to learn a little bit more. We've got Fair Housing with Bill Deadman coming up in October. And he is apparently a like an amazing um, speaker or presenter. So I know we've probably all taken many Fair Housing classes and should continue to keep taking them. But this one, I know he's like a standout speaker. So hopefully some people will be able to join for that as well. Yeah, he was the lead reporter on that issue that was in Long Island. That oh my gosh, that's right. He was the okay, that's right. I, and now he's kind of taken it on like a little road show. Yeah, mm -hmm. that was a good one. And then obviously our Sweet Sixteen CE days, which we offer throughout the course of the year. We've got a set of those coming up. Next latte and learn. Oh, the next next latte and learn. Or no, this is the most upcoming latte and learn exploring. Uh -huh with Dr. Jenny Inker. Yes, it's the second to last one. Um, and this one's hosted by YPN and it is sponsored by our CAR DEI committee. Oh, awesome. Okay. Oh, okay. The technology series. Is this with Matthew Rathbun? No. Oh, okay. Oh, yes. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Oh, good. Look, some like sometimes these things that are up in my mind are right. Um, okay, so Matthew, I think you guys have probably taken many classes with him in the past. Um, he does a ton of technology, AI, social media, and he teaches on all sorts of stuff. And um, he's coming back for practical AI. And I've seen a little piece of if this is the same class he was teaching, I've seen a little piece of it. And it is very nice because I think we're getting lots of AI stuff coming from a lot of different directions and everybody's trying to weed through what's actually useful and what are, you know, what's just going to be um, too cutting edge to not be relevant soon. Um, and his is very helpful and very specific to just how to use it for real estate, not just all marketing in general. So uh -huh. it's a great tool. I mean, I, uh, I'm just starting to use it. And so is Lauren. We were on a training yesterday. And if you don't know anything about artificial intelligence, you definitely want to take this class because it can help you in your email writing, in your um, maybe like a description. Uh, it's just, it, it's a fun tool to use. Well, and so many colleges too now have AI classes that you can take. Like William and Mary has a whole law class about how you can use AI to write contracts. Uh -huh. how you can use AI for your legal studies and in the court. So and evil robots and how to defend against them. I will have to lean on you all to describe what that class is about. This is another Matthew Rathbun class. So yeah. anytime he teaches anything, he's the biggest guru for, for technology that I've ever seen. Um, I think you'll definitely enjoy this one, but it, it talks about engage the digital world. Um, 
and it says opportunity for agents like not likeness to be duplicated for infrious intentions. Financial data can be harvested from emails and clients can be falsely directed to wire funds to the accounts of evildoers. I think this is definitely a good, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, a good uh, Zoom class that's going to help you because these things are out there and a lot of us don't know anything about them. Yeah, it sounds like just risk management, liability, all that. Yes, all absolutely. Stuff, all sorts of stuff. Oh, and Pat Jensen Leadership Academy is coming up again soon. Um, mm -hmm. All right. So more information, you've got the QR code if you want to scan that to learn more about applying for the upcoming Academy. Obviously, an amazing, amazing um, way to learn more about the industry, learn more about what's going on here locally in Charlottesville, get more attached to uh, the Virginia Association of Realtors and just kind of figure out what it means to kind of support your association and your national membership. We wanted to throw this in because we want you to start looking for the, um, we're going to do the applications. I believe they're going to come out by March, but if you're interested in a leadership role, uh, being on the board, this is definitely going to help you with that. Awesome. And don't forget about our DEI library, which I you know we're slowly but surely adding more and more books as we learn about um, more great resources. And they are always available to you at the car office. Okay. Thank you for joining us for our latte and learn. I hope you guys all have your own little personalized lattes from the comfort of your home. And um, I love all these QR codes. I'll have to actually try one um, and figure out if that's the easier way to sign up for stuff. But I know that everything's all um, right on the website. Super easy to find all of this information in the back of our site as well. So if you guys have um, any other questions, let us know. Otherwise, I hope you all enjoy the rest of your Friday and have a wonderful, beautiful weekend and are all cheering for um, the University of Virginia and their football game later today. So that's my little plug. But everybody have a great rest of the week. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Scooter. That was awesome. We appreciate your time. Yep. Thanks. Thanks. Bye, guys. Bye.